Drug discovery is a really complicated problem and takes maybe 10 years and you know, about a billion dollars to complete. Mm -hmm. And once you have new compounds, you have to run them through all kinds of different assays and tests, ultimately in animals. And the costs of that are massive and the consequences of using that many animals are really, really problematic. Yeah. And you know, we can't get enough access to those systems in a practical manner to really develop the best new treatments for global disease. So we have to find new solutions to do that. Correct. Um, you're a cell biologist or cell I geneticist, I am indeed right? a stem yeah. cell biologist. Yeah. So, so what does that have to do with drug discovery? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I love to understand how a little cell can become a whole organism, but you can actually make these structures called organoids, which are super cool. You can think of organoids as mini organs. So we can make it from the brain, they're called brain organoids. We can make it from the lung, from the liver, from a whole bunch of different tissues. Huh. That, so, so an organoid, is that just a miniaturized organ or what, what is it? Yeah, just think, just think about it. When we test drugs, we're testing drugs for two things. Efficacy, you know, are, are they working the way they're supposed to do? And are they toxic or not? Right. If we can ask those questions in these mini organs instead of the whole organism, just think about the impact that could have. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, one, the whole phase one clinical trial is just focused on looking at safety and, and toxicity and being able to do that with these little organs are, are a fascinating tool. And so what, what's left to do? It sounds like this is already done. <laughs> not, that, not that simple. Uh, think about it, how complex the organs are. I mean, yeah, uh, let's use the, the long organoid example, the mini lung that I like to call sometimes. Our lungs are reside in a very complex system. We have the heart, we have the gut, we have the vessels. So when you're putting this mini organ in a culture dish, you're taking a lot of that information away. Hmm. So we're getting some of it, but not, we're not getting all of it. Sure. So, so what do we do? Well, I think we, we need to go in stages. Uh, there's two approaches that are being used. Number one, we combine different type of organoids and we make, make these uh, multi-organoid systems. But the other component, which I think is super cool, is we're adding engineering aspects to it and we're creating these little structures that are either called organ on a chip or microfluidic devices that combine the organoids with engineering components. Well, that, that's really cool. So when we, when we make new molecules, sometimes we make hundreds or thousands of them. You know, is this able to, to handle that kind of scale? Yeah, I'll give you an example. We can put about 10 of these mini lungs in a, in a well, and we have displays that have 384 wells in them. Oh. And I can easily stick 100 of these plates in a single incubator. When you do the math, that's 38,000 samples. Now take a second and imagine a room with 38,000 mice. That's a pretty big room. Now imagine 38,000 people. That is a huge number of individuals. Imagine the cost associated with those mice and the cost associated with the humans. And now the cost associated with that incubator. It's game changing. Yeah, that's that's remarkable because one of the huge costs driving discovery of new treatments is all of the ability to assess those molecules in different models of animal disease and then ultimately humans. And you know, it sounds like this can really make that process not only faster but cheaper. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's amazing. These organoid systems sound so powerful and so enabling. How do you make them? Where do they come from? Yeah, it, it's super cool technology. Um, we made a, a, a genetically modified pig where you can actually label the cells, the stem cells, in green. And so we can take a look at it um, and recognize and identify where those cells are. And then we can use machines that can take those cells and purify just the ones that are fluorescent. Once we have that cell, we can put it in the incubator. Under certain conditions, we can feed them certain uh, compounds that make them develop into these mini lungs. So we can go from a single cell to a fairly complex mini lung by picking the right cell and the right culture conditions or methods to grow them. That's amazing. So drug discovery is a really diverse team science driven field. And I know for me, I got into it as a chemist and a lot of people don't even realize chemists are behind a lot of the global health treatments that we have. And, you know, I'm wondering for these organoids, is there a particular specialty that a, a student would focus on in order to, to make new organoids? Or, you know, is it really a, a multidisciplinary approach? Well, I think make, uh, making the organoids itself is, is more of a, a discipline for the developmental biologists. But how you utilize those organoids is where the complex question is. Mm -hmm. I can make as many organoids as I can. 
but I'll, unless I work with a very broad range of expertises, I will not get those organoids to function as a drug discovery system. Hmm. That takes chemists, that takes data analytics, that takes people to create more complex organs, to add the engineering component. And to be honest, if I, ha if I was a student today, there's so many opportunities for a student to contribute to this field because they can literally go from the very, very basic cell biology to very complex mathematical modeling. Wow, that, those teams sound really broad. I mean, I can imagine even social scientists being involved. Is... Yeah, and when you start thinking how drugs are made and distributed, you're looking at commercialization, how you market those drugs, whether they're accepted or not, there's all, of, all of this impact, uh, um, especially when you think of a global phenomena. Um, mm -hmm. You know, having a drug in the United States that costs $100 may not be a big deal. Well, you go outside of this country and $100 is a lot of money. So it's not just about making the drugs, it's about distribution and cost. So again, you bring additional expertise into that question. Yeah, that's a huge issue with global uh, disease because many times you are very cost limited. And as I mentioned before, the technologies that we have are oftentimes so expensive yep. that we just can't get the drugs to the, to the right people. And, you know, the, the organoids maybe are a great advance in that regard. Correct. So I think it's one of those wicked problems that got many layers and, and a lot of opportunities for students to participate in uh, solving some of these questions. So the organoid sounds really exciting and powerful. You know, what are the biggest challenges facing the organoid field as we move forward? Again, let's just um, use the, the lung as an example. Even the lung itself is a complex structure. The rest of the body is complex. But, and so we're getting organoids, and we're getting organoids with a certain degree of, of complexity, but not full complexity. So for us, being able to replicate the complexity of the lung mm -hmm. is one of the first things we need to do. In the long term, it's really being able to collect information that's minimum, meaningful out of those organoids. So for me, the data analytics component is as important as the biological component. We need to make better organoids, but then we also need to figure out what is the information that we need out of those organoids. We might be able to get pretty meaningful information out of less than ideal organoids, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Like if you know what you're collecting, then maybe something that's not perfect can still give you information that predicts how that drug will work. Yeah, that sounds, sounds like you know, any information is better than the lack of information we currently have in drug discovery pipelines. Yeah, well now you know a little bit about organoids. Tell me about how organoids will impact your world. Yeah, so we try to make new small molecules that ultimately can be developed into drugs. And you know, one of the big hurdles in that is demonstrating that those molecules are safe that those molecules don't harm all of the different organs within humans, and ultimately that those molecules can have efficacy in a human model of disease. And failure oftentimes doesn't happen until years and years and hundreds of millions of dollars into that process. And, you know, if we could have more information about more of the compounds we make at an earlier stage, not only could we accelerate the process of drug discovery, but we could largely increase the success rate by having better information about which compounds are going to have toxicity, which compounds are actually going to work, not in a petri dish, not in a mouse, but in a human. And these organoid models sound like they could really dramatically improve our ability to assess that, both in terms of the, the you know, safety and in terms of the ability of them to work. And that sounds pretty cool. So if I understand correctly, basically, if you start with 100 drugs and then you put them on the organoids, and the organoids tells you, hey, only use three of them for all of the other experiments. Exactly. It allows to prioritize the molecules to move into more, more and more complicated and more and more expensive trials. And you know that right now we have to just use our best guess based on some anecdotal information, models, predictions. Um, you know, we, we don't have the data to say, you know, this is going to happen in a lung, this is going to happen in a kidney, this is going to happen in a heart. And, you know, being able to have that information on hundreds and thousands of compounds will greatly change our ability to prioritize which ones get moved to the top of the line to ultimately go into clinical trials. Those are still going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. But now with compounds that we have a much higher faith that they're going to be able to, to come out of those clinical trials successfully and not be you know, sidelined by issues with toxicity. Yeah, that's um, a big deal. Yeah. So I hear that it's hugely expensive to, to develop a new drug. Why is that? Yeah, so you know, we have all these diseases with treatments that, that aren't good enough or no treatments at all. And, 
in order to develop a drug, you have to not only make new molecules, you not only have to assess their ability to affect that disease, but you have to also show that they don't harm the humans in other ways. And you know, no one's going to take a new treatment for disease if it you know, has huge side effects or even deadly consequences. And so the process to go from a new compound to a new drug takes about 10 years and sometimes a billion dollars to be able to pay for all of the development processes and many of the failures along the way. I think one of the things that isn't really recognized often is that for every new drug, there's many, many, many failures that got very far along in the process but failed because there wasn't enough information early in the process mm -hmm. to let us know that there were going to be problems later. And so, you know, we can only work with the information we have available at any time. Mm -hmm. And so you make the best choices you can, but sometimes you run into trouble later and that comes at great cost. So a billion dollars is a lot of money. It is. is that why, why drugs are so expensive? That's partly why drugs are so expensive. You know, there's huge costs in the development of them. And as I noted, you know, you're not only ultimately having to afford to pay for the drug itself, but all of the other related development and failure and all of the ins and outs of the process along the way. And, and I think, you know, that's largely invisible to the mm -hmm. final user that just has a, a pill in a bottle. But there's so much that goes into it. And there's huge teams of very diverse scientists from almost every scientific and engineering field involved mm -hmm. in that process. Well, Josh, this seems like a pretty complex question. So how do undergraduates get involved? Well, NC State has built a number of programs and initiatives to really foster team science and include undergraduates in those experiences. There's training programs that undergraduates can get involved with, and we're launching a new integrative sciences initiative solely focused on bringing teams of undergraduates together in the classroom and in the lab to really engage them in these topics. And I know, Jorge, you've really built a lot in the Comparative Medicine Institute um, with respect to this as well. Yeah, we've concentrated on the research component because I think it's super critical for students to be able to participate in answering these questions, not just learn about the questions, but actually do some of the solutions. So yes, we, we embed uh, sophomores into teams and those uh, students stay until they graduate. The teams can be as, as small as two, but sometimes as great as four. And it just gives the student perspectives from different disciplines all asking a specific question. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I certainly never had any opportunities like that when I was an undergrad. Uh, same here. I yeah. think we're older. Yeah. <laughs> A previous generation. Yeah. <laughs>